From Washington to Warsaw, Paris to Ankara, Brussels, Berlin, Bucharest, and Belgrade. Through pandemics and political movements, cooperation and confrontation, digital divides, and defending democracy. The German Marshall Fund is at the pulse of transatlantic relations today, convening the experts and insights needed to navigate tomorrow's world. A warm welcome to all of you to this discussion about human rights and democracy in the age of digital transformation and COVID-19. We are so lucky to be joined today by Robert Spano, President of the European Court of Human Rights. President Spano, what an honor to host you on GMF's virtual stage. Thank you I'm very much, Karen the honor Dauphin. is mine. I'm Karen Donfried, president of GMF. GMF is a nonpartisan nonprofit dedicated to strengthening transatlantic cooperation. Some of our work explores the intersection of technology and democracy through our Digital Innovation and Democracy Initiative, through the Alliance for Securing Democracy, and through our support of civil society in Central and Eastern Europe. I would encourage you to explore GMF's website if you wanna learn more about our work in these areas. Across the globe, human rights and democratic institutions are under threat. Adherence to free and open elections, free expression and assembly, and the independence of the judiciary are being challenged, exacerbated by the pandemic. At the same time, the internet is transforming government and society accelerating both the ability to improve and to curtail fundamental rights. Robert Spano, as president of the European Court of Human Rights and as a recognized expert in the field of the internet and human rights is incredibly well positioned to help us understand these issues, to explore the impact of recent developments and of the role of the judiciary in protecting human rights and democracy. We are lucky to have Susan Ness, distinguished fellow with GMF Digital, who served previously on the US Federal Communications Commission, moderate this discussion. We would all be delighted to include you in the conversation. So please submit your questions using the Q&A function on Zoom at the bottom of your screen. With that, I will give the floor to Susan. Thank you so much, Karen, for your outstanding leadership of the German Marshall Fund and for setting the stage for the program today. Before we move on, just a couple of housekeeping matters. First, the program is being recorded and the link will be available uh, through the GMF website. And I believe it will be posted uh, later in the chat function. If you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A function as Karen suggested and add your name and affiliation. And we'll try to get to as many questions as we possibly can. Please note, however, that as a sitting jurist, President Spano is not able to comment on specific cases or matters likely to come before the court. President Spano. We are so delighted to have you join us today to talk about the role of the judiciary in protecting human rights and democracy at a time when the internet really is transforming both government and society. A little bit about uh, President Spano. You were born in Reykjavik and enjoy both an Icelandic and Italian heritage. A gifted student of the law, you had a stellar career in academia ultimately becoming the Dean of the Law Faculty of the University of Iceland. Along the way, you published three books and some 80 articles on criminal justice, constitutional and human rights law. You were also selected to lead major investigations as interim parliamentary ombudsman of Iceland and as chairman of special commissions investigating human rights abuses in government run child care institutions and allegations of sexual abuse by the former Bishop of Iceland. 
Finally, in 2013, he were chosen to serve a nine-year term on the European Court of Human Rights, rising again to be elected president of the court for a three-year term. And I will add that you've done all of this without yet reaching 50. So let me begin by asking, what has your dual Icelandic and Italian heritage meant to you? That's a great question. And it is one actually, which, which I've thought a lot about over these years here in France. Um, I think they have done quite a lot for me. In fact, uh, I always felt that I was a bit perhaps of an out outsider during my childhood in Iceland. We lived, of course, as you can hear from my accent, we, did, uh, we lived a few years in Canada, uh, in Italy as well. So I was very much an international child. And when I came to Strasbourg, to this international fora, where one has to navigate different cultures and different sort of views, viewpoints on societal issues, which are not necessarily originating from the same background, it actually uh, was very helpful for me. So, so, it has, so it has developed from something that I often felt was a bit of a difficult heritage into what has, I think, become a, a bonus, a really a, a, a very strong part of my, my trajectory in life. And clearly you've been working at a frenetic pace. How do you manage your work-life balance, if that's even possible? Well, <laughs> I mean, I have a, an, an incredibly wonderful wife. Um, she, we, we, we do things together. I mean, she has been a rock for me all, all, all of over these years. I have four children. Um, when it comes to my professional life, it is, it is one of discipline. It is one of passion. It is something that I love doing. Um, I think I am quite good at sort of organizing my time and trying to understand what are the important things I need to focus on. Uh, and I have quite a lot of work stamina. But that, that as, I, as you said, uh, maybe in the next few years, it will, it will start to dissipate a bit. But uh, I'm still here and, and I'm still having fun. Now we get to discuss a little bit about the Court of Human Rights. Many people in the United States and probably in Europe as well are unfamiliar with the European Court of Human Rights, which just celebrated its 60th anniversary. Very briefly, could you describe the court, how it was founded, how judges are chosen, and what its jurisdiction is? The European Court of Human Rights is an international court, so it means that citizens and residents of the 47 European states which comprise the organization around which the court is created, it's called the Council of Europe, have the ability and have the right to submit complaints if for alleg alleging violations of human rights in their home state to this international court. It was established in 1959 it works on the basis of the European Convention on Human Rights, which is this international covenant, this international convention on human rights, which these 47 states have accepted and ratified and have obliged themselves to follow. The judges of the court are selected by the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, which is a group of national parliamentarians from these 47 states, which form part of the parliamentary body of the Council of Europe. Each state submits a list of three candidates after an open call for application within the home state for judges to be elected to the court. And then it's for the parliamentary assembly to, to elect one person, one candidate from the list of three. The um, member states in the European Union have two courts that address human rights issues. Your court, the European Court of Human Rights, and the Court of Justice of the European Union based in Luxembourg. How does your authority differ? And do you coordinate to avoid conflicting decisions? 
It's a very important question because uh, it is often misunderstood uh, sort of the jurisdictions of the two court. As you said, the member states of the Council of Europe, which is a completely different organization from the European Union, comprises, as I said, 47, 27 of which are the states of the European Union. So all the European Union states are also member states of the Council of Europe. So our jurisdiction is limited to the European Convention on Human Rights, which applies to the 47. The European Convention on Human Rights is, is however, also a, a, a set of rules which are applicable within the European Union, but they have a separate charter of, of, of human rights, which is the, the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. And that is the basic document upon which the, the European Court of Justice decides cases based on human rights. But what the European Court of Justice also does is it takes account of the case law of my court, the European Court of Human Rights. And what, we, what you see from the case law is, an, I think, an attempt by both courts, because the human rights we are dealing with are, of course, very similar. And in fact, the European Court of Justice, under its Charter of Fundamental Rights, is supposed to take account of the Convention, the European Convention on Human Rights. So there's a lot of symbiotic relationship between the two courts. But we have situations where the two courts maybe are not in perfect alignment. And in our ongoing judicial dialogue, we then see to what extent in the future development of our case laws, there can be a realignment so as to create as much of a level playing field and as much clarity to human rights protections in all of these states as possible. That, uh, it'll be very interesting uh, if uh, and when the European Union joins uh, the, the uh, Council of Europe as, as a full-fledged member with a justice on the court. Is that likely to happen, happen anytime soon? Well, as you know, uh, uh, the Union, the European Union acceding to the convention is, is, was very close to happen uh, about six or seven years ago. Um, the European Court of Justice then considered in an opinion that, that, that the draft accession agreement uh, was problematic from the perspective of EU law. Now, as I understand, the member states of the Union and the Council of Europe are in, engaged in treaty negotiations, agreement, accession negotiations, and we will see how that uh, uh, transpires. My hope, of course, is, and I, I think it is from the perspective of pan-European human rights protections and the rule of law, I think it is uh, something that I hope will happen. But that is a political issue, and it is for the political office holders and, and those in power to decide at the end of the day whether there is a wish to proceed in that manner. Hi, uh, we have a question from Vince Cerf. Are there specific rules for standing that admit a plaintiff to lodge a complaint before your court? Yes, so we require what we call under the convention victim status, which is the same, sort of roughly the same as the classical, uh, classical norms of standing. So there has to be an individualized harm. There has to be an individualized risk of harm. And, and we have broad case law, a developing case law on this. There is also potential of indirect victimhood, which, which we have also developed because we're dealing with a human rights mechanism. And a human rights mechanism can, of course, it can, of course, the paradigm in which a human rights violation can occur can, of course, be quite different from some of the other fields of law where issues of standing are more clear cut than in an international arena like ours. So yes, there are there is a requirement under the convention that the applicant has what we call victim status, which is roughly sort of at the outset as, as a start point of departure, the same as standing. And how do you how does your court enforce its judgment? In the system of the Council of Europe, the court itself 
does not have powers of execution. In fact, our judgments are rendered, they are binding under international law. The member states of the Council of Europe have pledged under the convention to execute those judgments, but the supervision of this execution process is in the hands of a political body, which is the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe. This is a represent, representative organ of all of the member states of the Council of Europe. So it's actually the member states themselves within a political process that supervise that each member states actually, actually execute the judgments. So it's not the court itself that has powers to, to, to in that process. I recall that the court is, is known for having a fairly substantial backlog of cases. Um, how many cases are actually in the queue and what uh, are plans to resolve them? For example, do you use artificial intelligence as a case management tool? Indeed, one of the recurrent themes of the work of the court for many years now is uh, its extensive uh, caseload. In fact, it rose uh, in, the, in the spring of 2011 to 161,000 cases pending. We have managed by the use of filtering mechanisms, by the use of what we call a single judge procedure. So each judge has authority to dismiss non or uh, ill-founded cases to reduce that caseload to a, the, a current caseload of 65,000 cases. So we have reduced that number over the past decade by 100,000. But still, that is a very, very extensive body of cases that we have to deal with. And we have, throughout the last decade, uh, been introducing various reforms. And one of them, certainly, is the use of information technology. And we are now sort of in a phase where we are looking at to what extent we can, for example, at the registration phase, introduce algorithmic or automated decision making so as to try to reduce the extent to which sort of this classical registration process has to all be done manually but to an extent that when it is done we can use the data uh, introduced within the system in a more effective manner this of course requires research and it requires looking into the various modalities, but I do think moving to the future, a mass bulk case court like ours will slowly start introducing uh, algorithmic uh, tools to facilitate its task. You've, you're now almost completing your first year as president of the court. Uh, what uh, lessons have you learned and what would you like to accomplish by the time your tenure has expired? Well, the first, uh, the first lesson that I've learned with maybe not a lesson, an acknowledgement of the fact that this is a very tough job. <laughs> I, of course, realized that beforehand. I had been at the court for quite a number of years before I was elected president. Uh, remember, I'm elected on 20 April last year and took office on the 18th of May within the first lockdown in France. So the first real challenge we have been facing, like all of us in this world, is the challenge in relation to the pandemic. So not only was I, uh, you know, did I start presiding this court, which is in, in and of itself in normal times, a big challenge, but over and above that, uh, there have been a lot of challenges which accompany the fact that we are in the middle of a pandemic. It's, there are a lot of logistical and administrative difficulties. This is a large institution. We have about 650 staff and the president, along with the registrar of the court, who is the top registry official, we are working 24-7 to keep things moving to take account of difficulties with teleworking, with video conferencing, with having judges, president Strasbourg, and so forth. So, I mean, the first year has been extremely hectic, but, but uh, it, it is a great privilege. Moving forward, um, my hope is I have about 20 months left. I, I will be here until almost the end of next year. 
Um, I hope there are several initiatives that we are working on. We are working on a new case processing strategy where we are trying to use our resources in a more targeted manner. We are, as, you, as we mentioned, looking into issues with information technology, which is, which is very important. But at the end of the day, the work of a court is, is classical judicial work. And I hope that I can continue to contributing in, in making the court as effective as, as it can be and to rise to the level of dealing professionally, independently, impartially with the tasks assigned to it under the European Convention on Human Rights. Thank you. I just want to remind everyone, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A tab. We have quite a number of questions already. Uh, and give your name and affiliation if possible. I'd like to turn now to a discussion of the elusive and ever fluctuating paradigm of the internet and human rights, to borrow your very elegant phrase. You've spoken frequently on the importance of rule of law in a democratic society. Why is the rule of law so important? And what does it really mean? Um, that, is, that is a great question. And it's an important question because it is, I think, dangerous in these times to view the rule of law as as an empty vessel, as a slogan, as a rhetorical device, because it is a fundamental rule of law, as well as a fundamental uh, principle of, of democratic societies. What does it really mean? It means two things, at least under the convention or my the, 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 the document that I work on the basis of, and I think this applies to most constitutional democracies, it means on the one hand that as individuals in democracies, we have, we have to retain and have to preserve and government has to respect a certain element of personal autonomy, which means that we must know beforehand, we must understand what are the rules of the game? How can we behave ourselves and dis decisions we take in a society? How can we take those decisions knowing what are the consequences of our actions and what are the limits we have and what, uh, what discretion is afforded to us as, as individual human, human beings. We must secondly be safeguarded against arbitrary decision-making by those in power. Power in, in democratic societies and indeed in any human society is exercised by humans. So we make a distinction between the rule of law and the rule of men. We want laws to be enacted because it is the law which then directs the way in which societies develop. But there is another facet here which I think is very important. The rule of law is not just a framework. It's not just a requirement that laws exist. The rule of law is also a requirement that, that laws substantively provide for certain values. Protection of human rights is one of those values. Individual liberties in democracies is another of such value. And I think we must continue to preserve this idea that there is such a thing as the rule of law and it is something that is worth fighting for. That it is not something which we can dismiss as being unimportant or lacking in substance. I would actually maintain and, and I think for present day purposes, the rule of law has become more important than ever because it brings us back to first principles, which are the principles of the kind of de constitutional democratic orders that we have been introducing, we have been, I would say, fighting for, for the last 70 years and are now in a position to have to defend and protect for the future. Well, certainly the rule of law uh, we've seen in the United States is, is something that always needs to be protected. Uh, we uh, had uh, many instances over the most recent period of time where there were challenges to the rule of law, but fortunately uh, we, uh, we seem to be moving in the right direction. 
Let me ask you about something that um, you've talked about before, and we also had a question from Eileen Donahue on. You noted um, the centrality of due process in a democratic society. The internet is global, and online companies essentially govern themselves through their own terms of service while also responding to local law. There's often, often little recourse if a platform deletes or demotes user content or deactivates an account for violating its terms of service or for leaving up content uh, that may uh, be harmful to individuals. Could you elaborate on an idea that you previously have discussed for a speedy, totally online judicial process to adjudicate user complaints where free expression or human rights are implicated? I think it is important uh, sort of at the outset uh, to be aware of what the internet is in this regard. And I'm not talking about it from the technical perspective. I'm talking about it as a transformative phenomena for human to human relations and the way in which our societies are developing. I've said before, uh, I mean, it's a great honor to have Vince Cerf here as, uh, among us as one of the founders of the internet. It, it is one of the greatest interventions in human history. But with any such kind of tool, with any such kind of phenomena, if you're looking at it from the perspective of first principles, human to human relations, we have to realize how this development will impact some of the principles we have taken for granted in the offline environment. Because what the internet does, it creates an environment where certain interactions are occurring outside the classical paradigm of human interaction being regulated by governmental power. Why is that? That is because the environment is sustained by private actors. Fine. I think it is, the time has come for us to realize that this environment cannot be divorced from the realities and the requirements of classical rule of law and due process principles. So that means, for example, that the way in which freedom of expression develops over the, on, the, on the internet, in, in, in the online environment, the way potential harms occur in the online environment have to, for the sustained integrity of the system, for it to be morally acceptable in the long run, we have to ask ourselves, how can we create a framework around this environment, which allows it to be, well, let's say dealt with, regulated on the basis of these principles, which I've mentioned, which apply in the offline environment. Now it's clear in the internet environment, uh, you know, use the, the usual approach of, for example, defamation suits being uh, regulated through classical courts is a difficult one. We of course see now uh, an awareness by some of the platforms with external uh, monitoring bodies and, and sort of decision-making bodies that this is, a, this is something which is necessary. There is another. There is another approach, which 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 is potentially possible, which is to view uh, uh, litigation or disputes arising on the internet as disputes that that shall be that should be dealt with in a novel framework of regular courts. But there, you have to really think outside the box. The idea must be that you have an expedited system, what some have termed, and we have, you know, in this environment talked as e-courts. The idea that you can create a system within the jurisdiction of each state which deals with online disputes through the use of classical legal principles, but in an expedited fashion, which allows recourse to online environment or online e-courts, which are dealt with by regular judges, which are specially trained to deal with that issue. This is a policy-based issue, which, which I think is, is important, but it, the, the reason that it is important is I think it allows a dis discussion on how the online environment 
for the future, for its integrity in the, for the future, for it to be a sustainable system of human interaction is subjected to and, and undergoes an evaluation and, a, and an application of the classical principles of, of rule of law and due process, which we have accepted are necessary in any democratic society. We talk about the difference between offline and online uh, issues. Is there a difference between offline and online hate speech, for example? In, and is there something essentially different requiring the court to develop different analytical tools for that? I'm thinking scale, the uh, enormity of the scale of content uh, that uh, breezes through the internet on any given moment or day. I mean, I, I would answer this by referring to um, uh, one of the landmark judgments of the European Court of Human Rights, which is very well known in this field, which is the, the judgment in the case of Delphi versus Estonia, because that is exactly the paradigm that you're referring to, Susan. And that is a situation where hate speech related uh, comments are uploaded by users on a website. Uh, and then you are out of the classical paradigm of author and victim being in, an, in, a, in, a, in a bilateral relationship, but you have a triangular relationship, which is author, the user, the intermediary, and uh, the, the harmed person. And what the court said in that case that states may be under a positive obligation because remember in my court it is always the government which is the respondent it's not the private actor which was of course the website in this case member states are are potentially justified in actually applying or imposing liability in this triangular relationship on the intermediary now why is that that would of course be potentially unthinkable in the classical offline context. The reason is that is exactly what you mentioned, the potential scale, the potential distribution, the virality of the nature of, of hate speech on in the online environment has thus, to some extent, engendered a development within the law towards recognizing this triangular relationship and imposing vicarious liability, we can call that here, on the intermediary, which would potentially not be possible in the offline environment. But here you have, you can see how the law is trying to grapple with a novel paradigm, which in many respects is, it's in its infancy. And it is a recognition that with, as the court said actually in the reasoning in Delphi, with the immense benefits of the internet, there are also come with it potentially very significant harms. And it is that balancing exercise which the law has to grapple with at any moment. In that, talking in that about that case to some extent, is there also not a concern that by imposing liability on an intermediary that, there, that has the impact of chilling speech would an, an intermediary that carries user-generated content, for example, uh, not uh, be concerned, and potentially, particularly smaller companies uh, that don't have resources, uh, potentially simply cutting off uh, any uh, user-generated content features uh, to avoid liability. Uh, we're certainly discussing these questions right now in the United States. And of course, these are questions that uh, Europe has been grappling with for some time as well. Uh, indeed. And I think one of, the, one of the criticisms of the Delphi judgment was the, the, the actual finding of the court that under the European Convention on Human Rights, remember, and I think this is for your audience important to realize, that the European environment when it comes to free speech is of course normatively very different from the First Amendment, uh, you know, Article 230 context in the US where 
you know, the immunity granted to these platforms is not what we are relying on here in, in Europe. So the court had to deal with a, a, a normative framework which actually allows far more restrictions on free speech than one would see in the US. But over and above that, the Delphi judgment was to some extent debated because of exactly the point you mentioned. And in subsequent case law, the court has demonstrated that the holding of Delphi is one which is to some extent limited. So for example, the economic size of the operator, the, the nature and purpose of the operator will matter. Uh, the bigger the operator in the economic size of scale, the more justifications there are for in, imposing types of liability. Uh, this, of course, is a slippery slope, and where you draw the line can be quite difficult. But we have follow-up cases where we have found a violation of Article, the free speech provision of, of, of the convention, because of the imposition, unjustified imposition of liability on intermediaries, which are much smaller or very different in scope from the one we dealt with in the case of Delphi. One of the issues that we are discussing in the United States, which of course is not uh, part of the uh, 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 European Convention, um, was the suspension of uh, a president's account following the January 6th insurrection at the US Capitol. Uh, some platforms suspended his account citing violations of their terms of service an ongoing uh, potential for further incitement of violence. Can you share some uh, general thoughts on whether private companies should be able to curtail online content posted by high level elected officials? Or does a, a politician have an, absolutely, uh, an absolute right to be carried on a platform? What are the principles, uh, competing principles at issue? Well, uh, I mean, again, here, uh, please forgive me, I have to be very careful because there it's clear that these kinds of issues will uh, come before my court uh, in the foreseeable future. In general, under the convention, the, the big question that arises is to what extent would the free speech provision of the convention provide a Twitter user with a potential right to complain that the state in which that person resides does not protect or allow that person to have a particular type of procedure to be able to challenge the decision, the takedown or deletion decision of a private platform. So within the paradigm of the European Convention on Human Rights, it, is, it would be viewed as a question of the state's positive obligation under the free speech provision. This is of course very different from the US constitutional context because there the question of the state's positive obligation to provide for speech is not the usual paradigm because under the First Amendment, you're viewing it from the negative perspective. It is the, it is the government can, that cannot restrict speech. So within the European context, this question will arise. To what extent in a situation, the paradigm you just mentioned, the factual scenario of Twitter takedowns or Twitter account deletions, there is an actionable Article 10 interest for a, a case being lodged against the state in question if there are no positive obligations. I cannot give you an answer to that question that because that is, that's an open question, but that's sort of the framework in which uh, a, an issue like that could potentially be litigated. Yeah, it, there are so many of these questions uh, that uh, given the, uh, the rapid involvement of the internet cause uh, very novel uh, uh, 
both uh, analyses and, and uh, everyone is trying to work through how one addresses these. One question that's come from someone uh, uh, who is uh, in our audience, could, the, uh, could you perhaps address the issue of mass surveillance and how jurisprudence of your court is moving in this space? Or are we getting to an issue that once again uh, may cause uh, may cause a little bit of heartburn? Uh, indeed, because at the moment we have uh, uh, pending cases in the grand chamber of the court dealing with exactly that issue. The question of what we call bulk surveillance. These are cases from uh, coming out of the UK, the United Kingdom and Sweden. Um, so it is a very, very topical issue and one in which I, I would refrain from commenting on, I'm afraid. Totally, totally understand. Uh, switching back a little bit, a uh, question from David Kay. Uh, on uh, the rights of companies such as platforms to shape the information environment as they see wish, do they have such rights? Hello, David. Uh, sorry, I can't see you. It would be nice to see you again. Um, from the perspective of Article 10 of the Convention, uh, the, the, the first principle would be a, a, a yes. I mean, s private actors like individuals have a right to impart information. Uh, they have a right to be the disseminators of speech. That is clear. Um, and that right is, is quite broad. Uh, with that right come duties and obligations. That is the framework in which we work under the convention. Uh, with every free speech related right, there may be uh, a potential justification for restricting that right. Uh, uh, if certain conditions are met, th that the restriction is prescribed by law, that it pursues a legitimate aim, and is what we call necessary, or in the convention, necessary in a democratic society, which we have interpreted to mean that there is a pressing social need for the restriction in this context of uh, a private person's or a legal person's right to take part, to disseminate speech in the democratic environment. Now there you will look at, um, you will have to look at the nature of the speech. Here we have a difference between the, again, the, the US constitutional approach, which is very much content neutral. Government cannot look at the content of speech, cannot discriminate based on different views of content. Whereas in the European landscape, that is, that is not as clear there is more flexibility for states to make distinctions based on the content of speech. For example, hate speech or speech which would be completely constitutional in the US would be potentially in violation of the Con European Convention on Human Rights. Or in other words, a state would be justified in restricting that kind of speech. So the answer to, if I understood uh, Professor Kay's question is, is in the European context, yes, but again, it is subjected to duties and obligations which states can decide to impose on private actors. And you were talking again about the differences between, for example, US uh, constitutional First Amendment rights and uh, the laws in, in Europe, accepted laws in Europe uh, regulating uh, to some extent content. When you take the internet, which is global, uh, you have potential jurisdictional conflicts. Uh, how do we strengthen rule of law and at the same time ensure that states do not impose on other countries their definition of illegal content where others may consider it to be legal speech? How do we balance those concerns? I think when it comes to questions of uh, jurisdiction, a uh, question of the, the trans-border effects of the internet, 
I'm afraid in that environment, multilateralism, uh, states coming together in the field of international law, coming together with uh, common views potentially formulated in agreements, treaties, and conventions is the only way forward. Uh, at the end of the day, we can always have a unilateralist approach where states can regulate uh, the internet within their borders, but that is always going to be to some extent artificial. And at the, the general principle, of course, is that states can, you know, under international law, they can as such enact laws which will be enforced within their borders, but which may potentially have extraterritorial effects. That is, that is potentially possible. But I think from the perspective of legal certainty, from the perspective of the rule of law, from the perspective of creating as much of a level playing field, multilateralism in this context is very important. Of course, to what extent that is feasible as a matter of politics, as a matter of policy, is something that I have difficulty opining on. But as a legal matter, I think it's very difficult to regulate jurisdictional problems without using the multilateralist platform for that kind of, uh, for the, that kind of work. We have uh, received quite a number of questions. And if uh, people want to submit questions for the last couple of minutes, that would, uh, that would also be uh, terrific. Uh, looking through some of these questions, uh, obviously this has been quite a, um, an inspiring conversation. Uh, okay, here's an interesting one. Uh, there is latent hope and assumption that the rule of law intersects with human rights, ethics, and morality. Historically, this has not been the case, our writer says. Example, the slavery of blacks used to be legal in the United States and, and in Europe, I assume. Currently, this latent assumption is not always true. Uh, in some countries, there are shades of trafficking that are technically legal. All of this is amplified by the internet. Are there any actions that the court is taking to bridge this divide? Now, first, uh, a court of law doesn't take any actions. Uh, to make that clear. The, a court deals with cases that come to it. Uh, it doesn't have an agenda. It doesn't have a, a policy in how the law develops. It deals with the cases as they come to it. As I mentioned, when it comes to the rule of law, I think I can only simply describe how the European Court of Human Rights has developed that concept. And it is a concept which is more rich than uh, the, the, what has sometimes been termed the thin version of the rule of law, which is that it is simply a framework. It is a construct. So we're not asking what, what substance the law has, so long as there are laws. And they can be as terrible as, as po possible. But if there are laws to regulate behavior, the rule of law as such is met. Now, under the Con European Convention on Human Rights, I think that is an overly poor description of the rule of law. It is a substantive concept. It requires uh, that, um, that member states of the Council of Europe have or respect also certain substantive values, which what one can extrapolate from the European Convention on Human Rights. It is a set of values. It is a framework of values, just like the US Bill of Rights has a framework of values, which then a court needs to identify and enforce under the rubric of constitutional or convention rights. Um, so I think the lessons, certainly the lessons of slavery in the US, the lessons of the Holocaust uh, of the Second World War were, that a very poor, thin version of the rule of law is unsatisfactory as an adequate description of the requirements of the rule of law in contemporary societies. And I think neither 
the rule of law, I would submit under the European Convention on Human Rights. And the, the rule of law as a concept, for example, under US constitutional law is, is simply a hollow concept. It, it is a concept which requires a recognition of the importance of certain constitutional values and they are values which are substantive in nature. You have, obviously your court has dealt with a lot of uh, new issues uh, that extend beyond the four corners of uh, the convention. Um, what are some of the most significant judgments uh, that the court has rendered uh, over the last couple of years? Uh, anything that you want to point to specifically? We, uh, we have uh, dealt with a number of uh, interesting issues or important issues. I would say I would not maybe take the last couple of years, but sort of the last decade. Uh, I already mentioned uh, our fora into the internet age, which, which we have dealt with in, in a number of interesting cases. Uh, I would also uh, mention rule of law issues like the independence of the judiciary. We have, we have in several grand chamber cases dealt with very important issues about the appointment of judges, the dismissal of judges, uh, the detention of judges, for example. Those are very important cases. Uh, we have also dealt with very important issues dealing with uh, bioethics, questions uh, related to uh, end of life, uh, assisted, assisted dying, which has been an issue also dealt with by the court. Um, so in the past decade, we have had to deal with very, very difficult issues. Uh, and that is a recurrent theme. We now have our first pending cases dealing with climate change which will have to be dealt with in the foreseeable future. Um, cases, we have about three to 400 pending cases dealing with the pandemic, the right to life, uh, positive obligations of state, right to health, um, detention, uh, 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 prisoner detention in the field of the pandemic and so forth and so on. Uh, so there are a number of judgments we have rendered, which are, which are interesting and important, and also pending cases, which, which will you know, clarify the law in novel fields. It is a, certainly a fascinating uh, area of cases that, uh, that your court has been dealing with. Um, we only have a couple more minutes. Um, did, was there something in particular that you wanted uh, us to understand either about the court or about uh, how society is evolving uh, with the internet uh, and technology or any other topic that we did not have an opportunity to get to? Uh, we covered a lot of interesting things. I would say uh, when, it comes to, when it comes to the internet, Again, I think we are there, uh, legally speaking, maybe not technically speaking, but legally speaking, we are, we are still in the infancy of the legal trajectory of what we're going to see. And I think there it is, it is very important that we do two things you know, in the legal environment. One is to try not to forego or forget uh, settled first principles, which are, which, which it's, it's dangerous to lose sight of. But what we also need to do is we need to think outside the box. We need to be creative in the way we adapt settled principles to an environment which has a lot of benefits, but also is, has a potential for harm. It's that elusive balance, which I think judges will have to grapple with within their roles in applying the law. Policymakers are grappling with uh, every day now within their roles. States and policymakers and political power holders are grappling with within their roles. And, and I, I, I sometimes fear that uh, 
we are lacking sort of the overall picture here. There are, there are bits and pieces happening in different fora without sort of an overarching edifice of values that we are trying to look at. Now, of course, that is it's normal because it is very difficult to, 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 to identify necessarily uncontested values in this field. But I think uh, moving forward, uh, judges have to be careful, but at the same time, they have to grapple with the problem. They have to be willing to deal with the problem and they have to educate themselves when dealing with issues like this, because if not, they can get it very wrong. And, and I know from my own work, uh, that, is, that is my biggest fear, that, that there are issues there which I'm dealing with and having to decide upon where the information I have, the knowledge I have is, is scant and doesn't allow me to see the full picture and the potential legal consequences of an outcome that I'm arriving at. How do judges uh, become uh, educated or informed on so many of these issues that uh, certainly have only cropped up over the last couple of years? I mean, I think it is, it, it is for each and every judge, and I think it is a deontological duty of judges to uh, re-educate themselves about issues that arise. For example, I have dealt with issues of bioethics in my job. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a healthcare provider. Uh, in, in those cases, I have had to really grapple with issues that I haven't, and, and it requires preparation, it requires reading, it re requires you to immerse yourself into the issue before you. The same as regards the internet, that is, that is something I've been dealing with for a number of years now. Uh, but that is based on an interest, but it's also based on a, a, a necessity which comes with a job. And there are many other issues. Now, for example, I mentioned climate change. I mean, for for regular judges to deal with that, understand where the boundaries are for the judicial role, understand what the capacity of the judicial role requires you to understand the phenomena and understanding the phenomena requires you to educate yourself. So I think it is, it is a duty. It is a duty on those that are dealing with uh, and have judicial power to be always in a position to understand the topics they're dealing with. Uh, we have a question from Mar uh, Martine uh, Nashen, uh, who asks, noting that young people, uh, the younger generation is perhaps furthest removed from the kind of intellectual debates that we are having right now. How do we make them more aware or engaged on these matters and become active stakeholders uh, with their voices? Being a father of four young people, uh, ranging from the age of 11 to 25, uh, if the person that asked that question has a good answer, please convey it to me because I think it is an, an extremely important question. Uh, the answer to which uh, I, I don't have, not directly. I would, however, not underestimate the level of which young people are actually more engaged than we think. That is, I think, one of the potentially undervalued aspects of the internet. We may think that they are, you know, onlining there all day doing stuff or interacting in a manner which doesn't educate them, which doesn't give them, you know, intellectual feed. But I think that is an under, underestimation. Um, I think any intellectual endeavor, any any passion we gain in life comes from within. I mean, you cannot impose that on anybody. It has to be something that the person identifies. I would say that for those of us that think that uh, civic discourse, the mere fact of what we are doing now, talking to each other, interacting with each other in a civilized, open and intellectual manner, is I think a value we should never underestimate its worth because to some extent what the internet does, it creates an environment where people are making allowances. They're allowing themselves to be, I'm not gonna use the word sloppy, but they're not allowing themselves to perhaps take the time to interact in a more meaningful manner. 
one of the things that I hope we will see, maybe it's it's I'm being uh, overly positive uh, positive about that, or or uh, is is the idea that somehow online discourse, which now is in many respects couched in negative terms, that we can somehow find ways that that can be uh, an engagement which is more rich. Uh, maybe that will come with time when the young people of today are as old as we are in the future. They will have been brought up in this environment and maybe they can use it more wisely than we are doing because we are, we are incompetent to deal with the way in which the internet should be used. Well, that inspiring note, uh, I want to thank uh, you, President Spano, on behalf of the German Marshall Fund uh, for a most enlightening and enjoyable conversation. And I also want to thank everyone for joining us today. Once again, the video of this session will be available online. Thanks again. And thank you very much indeed. It was a pleasure.